Today on Detroit Muscle, we drop the shackles of domesticity and hop across the pond in order to experience how breaks are made, English style. And wouldn't you know it, we find a whole bunch of exotic rides too. Hey folks, today you're catching us en route to the airport because we've got a real special trip planned. And Tom made sure to represent in the way that he dressed. Tell me, have you ever seen anything so patriotic? I haven't. Well, that's because this time we're hopping across the pond. We've got some business to take care of in, yep, England. hop off the plane and into a car to take a ride west toward a town by the name of Northampton, where we're going to learn how all the major components for brakes are made. Well, we've come to see some good friends of ours, and that would be EBC Brakes. We've used them for several years, and they've been in business since 1983. They have four facilities, and two of those are in the U.S. And two are right here in the U.K. This beautiful 180,000 square foot facility is their world headquarters. This is where most of the manufacturing takes place, so let's go check it out. ABC was established in 1983. It was established by my father, Andy Freeman. He was uh, passionate about motorcycles. We moved into this building in uh, 2012. It's a big step forward from where we were. The uh, business has moved on a long way. Uh, the products have moved on a long ways, but we're still a privately owned, there's still a family kind of orientated business. This is where it all begins. This is James with EBC. I see you have some raw material. What's going on here? So Tommy, this is where it all starts. This comes in as aluminum billet from a local manufacturer in uh, Northampton, UK. And this is the first process. It goes on this machine and it's turned down. This is for our EBC Brakes Racing Division High Performance Floating Rotors. What part is this going to be? This is going to be the center hub for those rotors. And this is the center hub machine. This is the aluminum for the center hub. Um, and it gives a light weight for the, for the vehicle. The outer is made from a high carbon cast iron alloy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they're fitted together upstairs. And we'll show you that later on. Our main aim is quality throughout and a very high performance product for our new EBC Brakes racing division. So how does something like this get designed? Well, it's all designed in-house, Tommy. We have a center of excellence next door where the vehicles come in and they're fully fitted and all the design process is upstairs. Let's go and take a look. All right. So this is where the design happens, right? Exactly. So we get the vehicles in, uh, just down in the center of excellence here, and then Mark designs all the hubs for all the vehicles coming in. They're designed on site right here, machine down there, test fitted right there. As a matter of fact, Tommy, this is part of our new EBC Brakes Racing Division where we're making floating rotors, very high performance rotors for high performance vehicles and even race vehicles. So what's next in the process? Well, the assembly. And that would be where I am. Once this hub gets anodized, it comes here. Its first stop is this laser machine where it gets markings for identification, specifications, and quality control. As for the outer section of the rotors, they come in as cast iron discs, and then the slots are CNC'd into them one at a time. Well, we're back up in the assembly area, and we've got Adam here with one of the friction rings that's completed. Now, this is part of a floating rotor. What does that mean? That's right. So what we mean by floating rotor is the outside uh, disc is made of cast iron. It, obviously, we've got a bell made of aluminum or aluminium, what we call it. Uh, and the outside can expand and contract freely or independently of the inside bell. So obviously the pads are rubbing on this cast iron ring. Uh, that generates a lot of heat. When things get hot, it wants to expand. So actually at about 600 degrees centigrade or about 1200 Fahrenheit, 
this outer ring wants to expand by 1.6 millimeters. Obviously, if you don't let it expand like it wants to, then uh, what it tends to do is it tends to cone the brake disc. So if you're driving particularly hard, you can end up with some kind of vibration or heat distortion. So really in a floating rotor system, what we've got is we've got a bobbin uh, like this, which is uh, made out of a single piece of stainless steel. And there's eight bobbins per disc in this instance. Uh, and when the bobbin actually fits through the back there, you can see that the bobbin engages in this slot and allows up to three mil of free movement of the outside ring. One of the other main benefits of this, of course, is that when the outside ring becomes worn, you can undo all of the, undo all of the nuts, move the bell, and you can actually retain the bell and the bobbins and just replace the outer friction ring, which uh, results in uh, lower long-term running costs. Last of all, the center section is torqued down to the outer disc, and you've got yourself a rotor. Now that we've seen how those shiny rotors are made, it's onto the brake pads. Coming up, we head to another facility where they cook up some grade A friction material. Hey everybody, welcome back. We're here at the world headquarters of EBC Brakes in Northampton, England. And this right here is where all the magic happens because this is where brake pads are born. What starts off as rolls of raw steel goes into this power press. And what comes out is a brake backing plate. Now this thing would normally be used to just go ahead and glue the friction material on here. They can make backing plates for just about any application you can think of. But instead of just gluing that friction material on here, EBC takes it a step further with this machine. This is called the NRS machine. What it does is it provides a mechanical adhesion for the friction material to stick to, which is done at their Bristol facility. Time to hit the road again and head to Bristol, which is about two hours west of Northampton. And here is where the next step in the process takes place. This is the mixing area. This is, of course, where all of the ingredients get combined to form what's going to become the friction material for the brake pad. Now, can't tell you what they use because it's all proprietary and it varies for application, but they use this stuff right here, which you could use to make a bulletproof vest. And once all of that stuff is combined, well, it's gonna be sent down one of these chutes where it's gonna go through a preform and get attached to the backing plate and it's gonna look like this and then move on to the next step. That would be this machine, which heats and compresses the material for several minutes, giving it a much more familiar shape. Then the pads are baked over several hours to eliminate impurities in the material. Once that's done, they're removed, then placed into this machine. It grinds and cuts down the pads to a nice uniform shape. Next up is powder coating. EBC has a variety of colors which they use to designate which application each pad is for. These are obviously their green stuff pads, which are for sport applications. After baking, they get labeled and receive a layer of break-in compound. Next up, they get arranged onto a series of trays and moved upstairs. This is where they get packed into boxes and prep for shipping all over the world, including the U.S. They make a huge variety of brake pads right here in this building. Everything from bicycle brakes to train brakes, including these special pads for the racing division. Up next, we pop in on a cars and coffee event, but this one is all exotics. And later, we'll see how the final piece of a brake kit is made, the calipers. Hey folks, we're back and we've jumped back over near Northampton, England to a village known as Sharnbrook, where we found, of all things, an exotics cars and coffee. All right, well, I'm out front here watching the cars roll in. Ferrari F50, I mean, that says it all. We've got more Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Bentleys. I mean, you name it, supercars, hypercars, they're all here. And even though we're in England, hopefully, if we're lucky, we're gonna get to see some American muscle as well. Let's go check it out. This all takes place at the Sharnbrook Hotel. Tilly, get a radio. Under this guy's watchful eye. Mark, Dave, why did that Mercedes just drive straight through? He's Chiro Chiampi, the owner of the hotel. 
So we're bringing out all the supercars and the hypercars. We're calling it Cars and Coffee Schaumburg, but we're adding in another twist. It's for charity. So here today, we're raising money for Rays of Sunshine Children's Charity in London. We aim to raise over £10,000 in a year. Yeah. Well, we've got modified cars here as well, like this RWB Porsche. It was built in Germany, modified in Japan, and driven right here on the streets of the UK. We've got a bunch of other modified vehicles here as well. Tom? The common thread with these cars is that they're fast. There's anything from a ACR Viper to a GTR. Let's go check these things out. I don't know about you folks, but I haven't seen a whole lot of Lambos out in the wild. You have to check out Lamborghini Alley. It's practically raining these things around here. Personally, I think that's a bunch of bull. I prefer the prancing ponies of the Ferraris. Now we've got silver ones and gray ones, but of course we've got your regular red ones, which you normally see out in the wild. There's actually close to two dozen of them here. They're fast, they look cool, and yeah, that. <laughs> I mean, what else can you get any better than that, can you? It's fast and it looks cool, right? Yeah. That's right. As a matter of fact, we did manage to find some muscle cars grouped together in Muscle Car Row. I, I bought it from the previous owner. It was a race car at the time, and I turned it into a road car. You can get those lovely small cars in England, lovely, pretty little small cars, but at the end of the day, the V8, when you hear that growl, roar, there's nothing on earth like it, absolutely nothing. There's one thing about car guys, no matter where they are, they like to lend a hand. We've raised 26,200 pounds for Rays of Sunshine Children's Charity. Completely blown any expectation out of the water. Stick around, we're gonna take a trip to the foundry where molten aluminum becomes calipers. Hey, we're back. So far, we've learned how EBC in the UK manufactures top quality brake rotors, as well as the process to make brake pads. Well, as for the calipers, their bodies are cast just down the street here, about 10 miles in Kettering, where they start as this aluminum ingot here. Those ingots are put into this hot furnace here, where they're melted. And that hot molten aluminum comes out of there and goes into this low pressure casting machine. And when it comes out, well, it looks a lot like this here. This is Simon, and he's with Turner Aluminium. Simon, why do you use this process? We spent a lot of time researching, and we found that low pressure casting produces a far more homogenous, a sounder, stronger, greater strength product with less impurities in it. We end up making a really strong product. Obviously, it has a lot of forces working against it, and when it's breaking, it needs to be a very strong product. This process is the way to do it. So a little bit of machining, we'll have ourselves a caliper. Superb quality calipers. While it might look old school, this process isn't your daddy's gravity-fed casting method. The molten aluminum is placed under a certain amount of pressure, which, like Simon told us, gives you a much better product. But at the end of the day, it's still tough work. After a few minutes in the mold, the machine raises up to reveal these newly minted calipers. So Adam, I suspect you could probably ship some of this stuff overseas to be done. Why is it that you have stuff like this done here in your backyard? For sure, well for me personally, but also for EBC, it's really important that we can source componentry locally. That gives us more control over the process. We can make sure that we're getting the quality that we want but we can also make sure that we're getting the products at the price that's competitive to us. And also we like supporting other family businesses like ours. So for me and, and for EBC, we try and source componentry locally wherever possible. Uh, and that's why it's really important for us. Awesome, let's go build a caliper. What do you say? Let's do it, man. You guys have a huge amount of inventory. We do, Tommy. We have over 30,000 SKUs here. Where all do you guys ship to? Well, from this warehouse alone, we ship to over 120 countries and then we have Las Vegas to deal with North America alone. What all do you make product for? We make product for mountain bike brakes, mm -hmm. motorcycle brakes, go-kart brakes, uh, scooter brakes, ATV brakes, UTV brakes, car brakes, truck brakes, racing brakes, semi-truck brakes, railway brakes, 
about it. Well, after the casting process, the calipers get machined and then they get sent off to be anodized and they come back looking like this. Adam, what happens next? So then we bolt the calipers together, they become a complete full body like this, and then we send the calipers off to be coated. Once they've been coated, they come back, and this is where we begin final assembly. So the first thing we're going to do is install the crossover pipe. And then we're going to torque the fittings up to spec. And the next thing to install is the bleed nipple. So then we're going to torque the fittings. So next thing we're going to put the pistons in, but we're just going to use a bit of assembly paste just to ease the assembly here. Rub it right the way around. So next thing we're going to put the abutment plates on and fasten them with this bolt. Then we're going to put the bolt collar in place and slide in the M8 powder retention bolt. Right, so now we've finished with assembly, we have one absolutely perfect brake caliper. Well, we'll be the judge of that. Every single caliper which is made here is fully tested on this machine, Tommy. Let's have a go and test it. This machine pressurizes the caliper with up to 1700 psi of air to check for leaks and structural integrity. If no problems are found, the caliper passes. Well, James, I want to say thanks for having us and showing us some of your brake components. And I'm sure a little later down the road, we're going to hit you up for some product for our future projects. But there's a few more things that we want to see, so we need to hit the road. You're welcome, Tommy. Cheers. Hey, y'all, recently we talked about fasteners, mainly bolts and nuts, and that's because bolts are the most common, especially when you're talking about automotive applications. They come in different sizes and shapes. You can get different lengths, different thread pitch. They're made of different material and for specific applications as well. But bolts aren't the only type of fastener that's out there. In fact, we've got several different types right here in this shop, and I'm going to show you a few and how to use them. Well, this right here is obviously your run-of-the-mill screws. These are actually sheet metal screws, and they come in different sizes and shapes and lengths and different heads, like this one has a socket head. It even has a groove here for a flathead screwdriver. But mostly what we use here in the shop would be these Phillips head pan screws here. I'm actually going to install this one. Well, what's nice about these is the holes don't have to be perfect. In fact, if you can get the tip in there, typically you can drive the whole screw in. Now you could consider screws as temporary or semi-permanent, but if you want something that's a little more permanent, you could go to something like a rivet. And a lot of people call these pop rivets here, but you need a special tool to install them, which is this, what I call a pop rivet gun. Now they come in different size tips here for different size rivets. Just need to install this long end right here into the gun. You just insert the rivet in through the hole and start pulling the handle. You probably noticed that thing just popped off of there. That's why they call them pop rivets. And what happened is this stud actually broke off of the rivet and it broke off nice and clean there. Now that'll hold those two pieces of metal together for a long time, but to remove it, you'll have to drill it out. Now they make several different sizes of rivets in automotive applications all the way up to something about this big or even bigger sometimes. But to install a big rivet like that, you need a bigger gun like this one right here. Another good way to fasten something is with a nut insert, which is this thing right here. Now to install it, you use a gun that's very similar to a rivet gun. Just screw the nut insert here onto the gun. Now you want to make sure you install this in the piece of metal that you're going to be screwing to. And that would be a piece of sheet metal like this that's not thick enough, something you could tap. Then you remove the gun. You can take a bolt or a pan head screw like this one, thread it right in. Well, I hope this helps you out when you're building your next project. Maybe you can pick up some fasteners that aren't your regular run-of-the-mill nuts and bolts.